Good afternoon. Uh, hello. I want to welcome everybody to uh, the second advisory committee meeting for the East-West Rail Passenger Study. Uh, I'm sorry, East-West Passenger Rail Study. Um, my face is probably new uh, to you, uh, at least from the, la the first meeting. Uh, I have uh, taken over project management uh, responsibilities. Jen Schlesinger uh, left DOT, and as well as uh, Michaela Niles is uh, also uh, managing it with me. She's uh, in the back there, uh, but she's waving from around the corner. Um, again, uh, my name is Ethan Britland. I'm with MassDOT, and I just wanted to say a few things before we uh, get into the actual um, content of the meeting. Uh, if you parked in the building, uh, there is validation. You just have to go down to the um, first floor at the front desk, and they will validate your parking pass. Um, <clears throat> we do have uh, microphones for the advisory committee members uh, as we go through the presentation. If there are any uh, clarifying comments, we'll gladly take those, but um, we would like to sort of hold all of our questions till the end of the presentation, uh, and then we'll open it up to the advisory committee, and we have uh, two microphones that we, we can pass around or can be passed around. Uh, in the sort of final um, sort of housekeeping, if you want to call it that, or ground rules, um, understanding we have uh, members of the public here in addition to, to the advisory committee, uh, we ask that you um, hold uh, your questions to the end, and we will open it up to the public at the end, so you will have an opportunity, but we want to be clear on uh, our advisory committee uh, role and feedback comments, and then transition to public. So with that, uh, hey, Ned. Ah, perfect. <laughs> So here's uh, today's agenda. Um, so obviously, uh, we're going to have a presentation. Uh, I'm just going to go through. I did my welcome and introductions, but um, I think it would be nice to go through the advisory committee just because um, I'm you know, obviously new to the, to the project, but also just it's good to sort of, if people don't know each other and get to know each other, I know a lot of you know each other out here. Um, and uh, we're going to go over the meeting objectives. What do we want to achieve? And uh, a little bit of a study overview just to um, provide uh, some background for those that either weren't here or it's good just to reiterate, you know, sort of the impetus. And uh, the primary uh, pieces of our presentation are going to be our uh, assessment of existing conditions, which um, I'll actually get into that, uh, just some narrative on that when we go through the slides. And then uh, alternatives development, sort of what we've been spending our time doing uh, for the past uh, number of months. And then, uh, as always, we always get the questions, okay, so what's next? And so we'll go over our next steps. Um, so here, meeting objectives. <clears throat> um, again, this is an advisory committee meeting. We have multiple levels of public involvement, uh, the advisory committee being um, the uh, regional, local, uh, legislative stakeholders. Uh, we also go out to the just general public to have public meetings. So uh, the advisory committee's role is really for us to bring our work to the advisory committee and, and get feedback. So um, we want to, obviously the, the purpose of this overall study is to um, improve connectivity and mobility uh, in the east-west rail corridor between western Massachusetts and eastern Massachusetts. And uh, we also, um, we've developed a number of alternatives and that's, uh, we've narrowed it down to six uh, that we've come here to present today. So those are the two primary things we're going to look at. And again, as I noted, this is the advisory committee, so we want to um, hear what everyone has to say. Does this reflect uh, what we heard in the first meeting? Albeit I wasn't here, but obviously there's a lot of documentation that I was able to look at. Um, and then uh, obviously suggestions for any refinements. This uh, is our study overview. Uh, we often get asked uh, a lot about to those that aren't either transportation planners or engineers or in the in industry, it's, well, you know, where did, what is the process? Where did, where did you come from? Where are you going? So this uh, flow chart, so to speak, uh, gives us a, a good sense of, of, and I'll just go over it real quickly, but the star being where we are, and we went through our existing conditions, and that's, again, due diligence to document everything that's out there now. It obviously helps uh, when we're developing alternatives for our identification of issues, deficiencies, um, needs, things like that. 
And then once we get that established, we can go into alternatives development, which is what we've been doing for the past um, four or five months. And um, a good point to note here is these alternatives have only been developed to the extent that we understand them at a very high rough level. Um, after this meeting, after we present and, and get feedback, the next number of months are to analyze them in more detail. So right now, uh, admittedly, there, are, there may be questions that we just aren't able to answer right now because we haven't dug that deeply. So, but we don't want to get so far down the process that um, we bring something to you that we have to then tweak, change, uh, and, and double back and do different work. So um, that's why we have the point here where we bring alternatives development to the advisory committee, hear what you have to say, and then move on to the analysis phase. And uh, so one, after we will come back here, present our analysis for the six alternatives. The idea is to then narrow those six down to three, which we do even uh, some bit, a bit more, I would say it's more detail, it's not a lot more effort, but it's more detail, it's digging more deeply into the operations of, of the rail line, primarily. And then uh, we come back with uh, recommendations next step and the ultimate uh, product of a study in addition to recommendations is a final report. And all throughout, uh, we have uh, community and stakeholder engagement, a uh, total of three public meetings for advisory committee meetings, which is what we're here today uh, talking about, and existing conditions. Um, before I launch into existing conditions, uh, go around the room real quick and we can introduce uh, Rick. Uh, Eric Lesser, State Senator for the 1st Hampton and Hampshire District. Nancy Creed, President of the Springfield Regional Chamber. Ben Lamb, Director of Economic Development at 1 Berkshire. Uh, Smitty Pignatelli, State Representative, 4th Berkshire District. Tom Matusco, Executive Director of the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. Bill Hollister, Senior Manager for Amtrak Government Affairs for the Northeast. Lindsay Sabadosa, State Representative, 1st Hampshire District. Sandra Sheehan, Administrator, Pioneer Valley Transit Authority. Tim McGurthy, Deputy Secretary for the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development. Uh, Tim Brennan, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. We've got a second one. Astrid Glynn, MassDOT Rail and Transit Administrator. Richard Griffin, Mass Development, Mass Development uh, Vice President of Community Development. Liz Quigley with the Office of Congressman Richard Neal. Seth Nato with Congressman McGovern's office. Janet Pierce, Executive Director, Central Mass Regional Planning Commission. Beth Ann Steiner, Chief of Staff for Senator Adam Hines. Linda Dunn, Levy Franklin Regional Council of Governments. Uh, John Hassey for the Mass Railroad Association. Linda LaDuke, Town Planner, Economic Development Director for the Town of Palmer. Todd Smola, State Representative, 1st Hamden District. Tom Petrolotti, State Representative, Seventh Hampton District. And uh, are there any, uh, uh, Paul Matthews, 495 Metro West Partnership. Sorry for the late arrival. No problem. Are there any other advisory committee members across the the back row? No. Okay. Uh, I think now we should introduce the um, the study team. Uh, I understand that they were probably introduced in the first meeting, but just in case you weren't here, uh, Drew. Uh, good afternoon, Drew Galloway with the study team, project manager. And Michaela Niles, MassDOT, Office of Transportation Planning. Uh, Reagan Chekia from Regina Villa Associates Public Outreach. And I'll introduce Emily since she's up at the front. She's in the outreach team. And Ned, Ned Cott, uh, with, uh, deputy project manager for the project team. And that's the project team. And on the phone, we have uh, FRA. Jeff Price, just wanted to let everybody know that. Uh, he's, he's, on, he's right here at a conference call next to me. Um, Good afternoon. <laughs> thank you. So, um, you know, I guess, uh, so we have uh, existing conditions we're gonna review real quick. Um, we have rail conditions, but we also have our challenges and opportunities. So there's sort of the, uh, the, the documentation of the characteristics of, of the rail corridor, and then there's the, what we've identified. So. Um, <clears throat> here's our study corridor. 
Um, as far as uh, existing rail service on the corridor, you can see we have um, CSX obviously operates a lot of trains on the corridor. They have 14 uh, regularly operating trains a day, uh, and then they have that on-demand aspect. So um, obviously freight is a big consideration on the corridor. Uh, it is their line west of Worcester, and uh, we have to be cognizant uh, of, of the freight rail traffic. And MBTA, we have 27 uh, round trips on the Worcester line between Worcester and Boston. In the Amtrak, we have that one daily round trip uh, between uh, Boston and Albany, Chicago, and obviously uh, heads, you can head south into New York. That's quick. Um, so uh, we ultimately will have a, a full report of documentation, but just from a PowerPoint presentation standpoint, um, when we look at existing conditions, these are essentially things that uh, will inform everything we look at in terms of alternatives development. And obviously the, the capital investment is a, is a big part of it. So um, looking at the various curves, grades, terrain, uh, the track conditions, uh, how many tracks are there, uh, you're gonna see on a, on a subsequent slide of the alternatives, a lot of this information is actually wrapped into our alternative graphics. Um, uh, terminal capacity, things like that. Well, and obviously another part of when we're looking at the rail corridor, uh, a constraint, environmental resources. So we have uh, wetland protected resources down the end uh, bottom. And so that's the physical side of it. We also have uh, the operational side, and that was on the prior slide. We had for MBTA service, CSX, and then there's the uh, Amtrak service. Um, so as I noted earlier, uh, CSX owns uh, this, the line from Worcester to New York. And um, obviously freight, freight rail traffic is important for a lot of reasons, uh, but obviously uh, reducing vehicles on the roadway, uh, just economy, commerce. Uh, so we, we just need to be cognizant of uh, CS, of the rail line and freight. Um, there is shared use right now. Uh, the host railroad obviously has uh, the majority of the say. Uh, if, if passenger rail, uh, for exam, Amtrak, uh, does have the ability to use the tracks, but it's the host railroad that um, sets the terms and conditions. So again, shared use right now. Um, any increase in passenger use, there would have to be heavy coordination uh, with CSX and obviously whoever runs the service at that point. Um, and again, yeah, that last bullet, so Amtrak, so under federal law, uh, Amtrak has the right to use it, but CSX has control over those conditions. So th these are obviously things that um, are, are, whether it's just existing conditions or it's things that we have to be cognizant of as we uh, move forward through the study process. So. This is sort of a, a, a high level approach to uh, our, our constraints in the corridor or um, just really the, ex oftentimes they aren't necessarily constraints but it's just a documentation of what's out there and then we have to look at it and say is this a constraint, is this an opportunity, is this, a, is this an issue? So um, I'll just work west to east. Uh, we have a lot of uh, right of way and ledge, cons ledge constraint between uh, Pittsfield and Springfield uh, along that corridor. It's uh, single track for a lot of it, and uh, there's just a lot of steep grades and a lot of ledge, so that's obviously something we need to be cognizant of out in the western portion of the corridor. Um, there's obviously a lot of uh, uh, grade crossings as well, and, and those are obviously safety related that we have to be cognizant of. And uh, there's a lot of curvatures uh, that do uh, affect speeds and reduce speeds. Uh, we have some uh, graphics that, uh, that have the speeds along the corridor, so that's something that we have documented, and so as we're looking at alternatives, we understand where those, uh, those speed constraints are. And uh, there's a lot of uh, vertical grades, obviously, throughout the entire length. As we head out to Western Mass, the, the, the elevation just changes, so that's something that's a, a concern to rail line, to, to rail service. Uh, between Worcester, Boston, there's a lot of uh, passenger service, obviously, existing, and then there is some amount of freight service, so that's something we need to consider when we're looking at service west of, uh, I'm sorry, east of Worcester that there is an existing uh, passenger service on there that uh, we would have to, it would have to be worked around and worked into. And uh, there are a lot of curvatures uh, along, uh, heading really closer into Boston and obviously you get at slower speeds and there'll be a graphic to show that a little later. Um, and uh, as a complex at grade crossing in Framingham, that's uh, obviously been a, a long standing uh, problem uh, in Framingham. And then there are capacity constraints at South Station. So this is sort of the high level look at um, what are our major 
uh, issues going along the corridor. <coughs> and uh, so here's a speeds uh, graphic, and uh, our graphics later have these embedded in them, so uh, we can just quickly look at this. But the general takeaway is that um, right now the travel speeds are really um, low for passenger service. Uh, right now the rail line is really meant to serve freight rail, and the, there's a difference between what freight rail uh, needs and can, uh, and can use and what the needs are for passenger rail. So uh, this is really meant to highlight that um, in order to sort of uh, get a, high, a higher speed or a lower travel time, uh, the, right now the, the service is, uh, is pretty slow as evidenced by the Lakeshore Limited. So this is, so this was our you know, high level look here. We documented it and it's gonna be documented in more detail in the report, but this from a presentation standpoint, that's what we, that's what we show. Um, and now it's the alternatives development piece. So from existing conditions, you look at what your issues are and then you uh, develop alternatives and we base the alternatives on a number of things, but um, in, in this particular study, Obviously, there's a lot of um, uh, public uh, want and support for passenger rail service. And at the last meeting, we had an exercise where we asked sort of everybody um, what it is they'd like to see. And so while we had these goals um, up on the screen, these, are one, these have been more, a little bit more refined based on the public feedback. And so these are what we've set as our goals for developing our alternatives. And obviously, the, the key is just to provide better service from Western Mass to Eastern Mass connectivity, and obviously we want it done in such a way that it supports economic development in the best way possible. And obviously as you improve that connectivity east-west, you, uh, you know, there is the, the expectation that uh, the corridor and the station stops along the corridor are opened up as uh, you know, places that people would um, either choose to live and locate there so they, because of the connectivity to other employment centers or population centers. So um, that's a, another goal of when we develop our service alternatives. And as always, uh, reducing automobile trips. Uh, you know, certain parts of the corridor are extremely congested and so any relief we can pull from the highway corridor onto a, a passenger service would be positive for the highway corridor in terms of uh, reducing congestion and, and environmental uh, benefits. Uh, and then, so yeah, environmental benefits, greenhouse gases, air quality. Uh, so obviously any kind of uh, vehicles we can get off the road is a good thing. And so uh, again, I wasn't at either of these meetings. I wasn't on board yet, um, <laughs> but the, this is a synopsis essentially of um, our public meeting as well as the advisory committee meeting. And then we've gotten a lot of just unsolicited feedback via uh, email uh, to Michaela and others, uh, as well as uh, via the website. So, you know, I think this, I'm not gonna read through all these, but they, for the most part, they tie into our goals for service alternatives, but a key takeaway from this slide is that part of our job as, as sort of study project managers is to balance a lot of the wants and needs of, of the advisory committee and so I think a lot of these comments sort of, they don't, they don't conflict necessarily, but uh, there, are certain, there are certain folks that would like to see the lowest travel time possible. Others just want connectivity. Others want it sooner. So you know, our job is to, and when we, as when we develop alternatives and analyze them, that they uh, try to, as much as possible to balance uh, the wants and needs of the general public and the advisor committee. Um, <clears throat> So in addition to physical constraints and operational uh, services on the line already, uh, things that we considered and looked at as part of the alternatives development process, um, you know, obviously we're called um, factors that affect rail characteristics, but essentially, you know, population density, uh, where people are, uh, employment, where, where people want to go to, um, could be recreational, doesn't have to be employment, it could be lots of different things, doctor's appointments, so it's that, uh, the demand factor aspect. Um, uh, competitive, so competitiveness of other modes, uh, you know, this is obviously in the off-peak, it's easy, it's a lot quicker to be on the turnpike, but during peak, there's uh, a lot more uh, congestion, so 
we have to sort of think about it in terms of uh, the competitiveness, let's say, of automobile. So this is definitely something we're looking at. Um, major destinations, again, uh, as far as station stops or major population centers that's sort of tied to the first bullet. And then looking at it, you know, from rail service parameters. When we're looking at the alternatives, there are overarching characteristics as you're looking at them that you want to be cognizant of, and whether that's a, your travel time. You know, if it's, if it's going to be a travel time uh, that's, way, that's way too high, then it's just not necessarily going to be a desirable service. Uh, frequency, how often the, the, the trains would come. Uh, cost, cost is another consideration, which uh, is something that we'll ultimately get into, uh, but not for this meeting. Uh, amenities, uh, whether it be at stations or on board the, the trains themselves, and then span of service and, and where it connects to. So, the inverted triangle of our alternatives development. So, this, uh, whenever we do studies, you know, there's often, you know, because it is a, you know, it's a very uh, wonky type thing, that uh, this inverted triangle lays out essentially how we look at it from a, a you know, very high level. So there's the uh, higher level alternative screening. And we are right where we're bringing the preliminary alternatives here for feedback. So we've looked at a, a wide range, narrowed it to six. And I talked about this a little earlier, but um, I wanted to sh say it when we're looking at this slide just to understand graphically, too. Uh, so that was spring. Here's the summer. And once we hear feedback, we're going to go back. And that's when we look at ridership scheduling costs, things like that. So what you're going to see right now are just rough estimates of certain, let's say, travel time or, um, you know, whether uh, it be need for capital improvements. Uh, but once we dig deeper, we'll have more detail on what we'll show in, in a few minutes. And ultimately, there is the three final alternatives. And again, it's while it is not necessarily the bulk of the work, it's digging into a finer, or it's basically a finer grained look at the th at three of the alternatives, which obviously to be determined. Right now, we're just presenting six, and we want to hear feedback. So this, while you can't, while you can't actually read the font, uh, it's just, it's actually not, you're not meant to read it. It's just meant to be a graphical representation of uh, this was basically a variety of the looks of, of alternatives. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't meant to be <laughs> in detail. So these are uh, essentially what the team uh, looked at to try to, um, I wouldn't say mix and match, but how varying pieces of the corridor could be put together, essentially. Um, so I, this was meant to just show that we did do a lot of work before we came here and we're showing the six. And. Okay, um, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna pause there and I'm gonna hand it over to Drew uh, Galloway for uh, the rest of the presentation. He's gonna walk us through the alternatives uh, that we developed and I think um, one thing to note is that, uh, you're gonna go over it in, in a bit more detail, but we do have essentially three families of alternatives. Uh, so as you're looking at uh, the alternatives that we are going to talk about sort of a uh, how they fit into a, a family so to speak but also um, ultimately these alternatives build up they build up in capital improvements so uh, the f the first cup few alternatives aren't capital intensive per se so but that's not to say that as we get to the later alternatives there aren't more substantial uh, capital improvements or investments baked into the alternatives I take it no one wants to go back and look at the other chart with all the different alternatives. There's, there's more there. Um, so I, I'm, thank you, Ethan. I'm going to go through the six alternatives that we've advanced. It was through this screening process and in, in looking at many different attributes uh, with, within it. Um, and as Ethan said, I think it's worth repeating, um, these are not precisely as you would find them as we move forward. They're, they're intended to test a range of different attributes and parameters. Looking at travel time as one parameter, looking at investment as one parameter, looking at service frequencies as a parameter. 
different engineering environment, all those come to play. Um, and we tried to select alternatives that uh, components within them would be able to test those different parameters a, as we go forward. Okay, um, for each alternative, there are two slides. Um, and one is some descriptive material um, that defines what the alternative is, is about. And then we have a, a graphic um, that builds upon what, what you see here in, in the text. First alternative in a lot of these studies is essentially the no build. If you did nothing else, what would happen? You have a corridor, Ethan did a good job describing it. There's one inner city train a day, which is the extension, the Boston extension of the Lakeshore Limited between Albany and Boston and then on to Chicago eventually. Um, and it exists with a lot of different freight trains, big and heavy freight trains that are operating on what is arguably the preeminent freight corridor in New England. Um, it's a very busy corridor in its own right, and it's very important um, um, to the economy, not only to Massachusetts, the Commonwealth, but to all of New England as well. Maximum speed on this corridor is 80 miles an hour today. Um, that's on the east end in the MBTA commuter territory. Maximum speed west of Worcester is, is 60 miles an hour for pasture. Um, so as, as, as Ethan showed, it is not a fast corridor compared to other rail lines. It's actually faster, though, than some that other exist in other parts of the, of the country. Travel times today, which are shown at the bottom, um, you'll find for each of these alternatives, we're showing them as a range um, between Boston and, and Springfield, between Springfield and Pittsfield. And the reason, which, which Ethan described, is this is only a very conceptual level of engineering right now. Um, and so we don't have the level of precision and detail that would allow you to refine numbers to a greater percent. We haven't done the service analysis and all the stopping patterns, which can vary travel time, particularly high speed travel services. A single stop can add as much as 10 minutes to some line. So it's a significant impact when you think about some of the service patterns that are out there. Um, we are being agnostic as to the type of equipment Right now, it has to meet a certain performance standard, but don't know enough about the details. So from our perspective, it made sense to show this as a range to give everybody a sense what we think the likely travel times could fall within, within that. Um, the current Lakeshore Limited is two hours, 28 minutes between Boston and Springfield to give you a sense of perspective that way. Um, so this is the first graphic. This is for the alternative. Um, it's a busy graphic, and there's a lot of good information on it, we, we think. The top part shows the corridor um, by use of services, um, and it shows within the black lines whether it's double track or single track, and whether it's commuter service, or in this case, the inner city service. Um, the, the bottom line um, shows the speeds, and Ethan talked about that a little earlier in one of the earlier slides, um, broken into certain ranges. There's a correspondence to those ranges to a series of track standards and authorized speeds established by the Federal Railroad Administration. So it falls within a range, but they basically conform to the FRA track standards, which specify the maximum speed for each class of, of track. Um, and we've identified the areas where the maximum speed could be permitted in those areas if nothing else was obstructing. Um, <clears throat> I'll look at both of those alignment slides, graphics, um, and, and you know this better than I, but the topography in, in western Massachusetts um, is hilly and mountainous, and it tends to run in a series of north and south ridge lines, interspersed by a series of river valleys. Some are east-west, and the Connecticut River is still north and south. The rail corridor, when built, and still to that large extent, has this serpentine look to it um, to traverse the ridge lines and then use the valleys where possible and then traverse more ridge lines. Um, the team has ended up, because of that shape and that effect, calling these graphics the, sna the snake charts. It's not very glamorous, but it is descriptive, so I'll use that phrase as, as I go forward on, on it that way. And the last component to this chart is a uh, cross type effect on the bottom right. Um, and it gives you the types of services that are stopping at the various stations we've looked at. Um, so the blue circles there show the Amtrak service at the various stations. 
Um, the yellow is, is connecting service. Um, on the Connecticut River Line, the, the Knowledge Corridor, or the Hartford Line, as the state of Connecticut uh, likes to call it these days. Um, I'll also note for each of these alternatives, and we'll talk about it, um, both for the Knowledge Corridor um, and the Hartford Line, all those services will work through connection. Um, unlike the NERI study, for example, which had some direct service, we are testing this, that we think objectively, to understand the benefits on an east-west corridor um, and understanding how it connects. Um, so you'll see that uniformly throughout each of these alternatives. Any questions before I go to the next? Yes, sir. Even if I may, We'll, we'll get to that, so bear with us. Alternative one, um, and again, uh, we are starting with a um, progressively, in this case, lower investment scenario, um, both from an engineering and infrastructure investment perspective and an equipment perspective. And then as we go through the alternatives, you'll see that incrementing up, um, and we've made adjustments to each one. This is premised on operating essentially a rail shuttle uh, between Springfield and Worcester and connecting with existing MBTA trains on into Boston. Um, to connect to the west from Springfield, uh, we've established a bus shuttle, essentially, that would operate from Pittsfield um, to Lee to Blandford and then on to Springfield. Um, and using existing roadway networks in this scenario, not every scenario, but in this scenario, that's how it was laid out in, in this context. It seemed to make sense. You have a well-established infrastructure there already in the, in the roadway network. When you look at the demographics and the existing travel lines that take place um, th that we th actually discussed in our first uh, committee meeting, three out of every four travelers, commuters, from the Pittsfield area actually go to Springfield, and the balance go on to points to the east. Um, so it seemed to be a fair and objective test to look at it and understand the benefits of increasing the service and establishing firm connections either at Springfield or in the case of this alternative, we carried the bus connection down to Worcester so there would only be one, one transfer in that respect. Um, you also see the travel times in this case are not significantly different. While there's an investment in the rail line to improve it, there has to be even for a very modest increase increases in passenger service. The presence of the transfer taking place either at Springfield or at Worcester actually affects the total travel time. So it's reflected in the ranges that are, that are shown right here. And this is the snake graphic again, showing from a, from a operator perspective and a, a speed perspective how this, this service would, would sit. So the orange in this case shows the new rail shuttle operating between Springfield and Worcester and connecting on into Boston. The bright yellow lines there are the incremental track improvements that are necessary to, to accommodate a, a service of this nature. And then the dash, the dotted green line, um, shows the bus connection going to, to the west and then on to east to, to Worcester as well. Um, this format we're repeating for each of these so you have a sense of consistency in that respect. When you look at the station cross, um, you can see the types of services, whether it's a direct one seat ride or a transfer connection for all the various different lines, how it all comes together. Springfield Union Station is really living up to its name and it's converging all these services into, into one unified station. And so that's a, that's a very good thing. I think everybody would agree. Alternative two. Um, this would extend the rail service from Springfield right into Boston. Um, and so there would be a complement of new trains operating uh, between Springfield and Boston. Um, it still continues with the bus connection to Pittsfield, um, but because of the changes in the nature of the service, including having basically express trains operating between Worcester and either Lansdowne or, or Back Bay, um, the travel times are much improved compared to what would be a local MBTA train between those two sites. So you start to see that reflected in the travel changes. They are gradually coming down in, and it's, a, it's because of the type of service uh, that is being evaluated as well as the level and the type of infrastructure investments 
that are being placed in, in that respect. Maximum speed in this case is still 80 miles an hour as it was with alternative one. And this is the graphic to support it. Now you see the orange line is continuing all the way into South Station. <coughs> um, and it, it shows also you know, the same type of speed pattern on, on the, the, the snake graphic that we're talking about. And it shows how the bus service will continue to connect and complement the two um, in, in that respect. That's alternative two. Alternative three um, kicks it up a notch. Uh, not that I'm cooking anything here, but I can cite Emerald that way. Um, and this, this is a, an alternative that drew from the study and, and the findings, particularly of the NERI study. We're not replicating it, but we wanted to take advantage of some very good work that was done in that study and looked at, it had a, a good focus on improving travel times. Um, and, and it really um, made some engineering changes, particularly between Springfield and Worcester, that allowed a set of higher speeds than you would otherwise find with the existing infrastructure. It optimized curves. Still did it within a very active freight rail alignment, but, but we, we sort of tested the upper bounds within a shared corridor, shared track corridor, what could be accommodated in, in that nature. Um, it also looked at some, some progressive changes between Worcester and Boston to also improve the travel times. Those are working in concert with some projects that are already on the books um, in, in terms of, of thinking about investment, uh, specifically uh, the new station improvements at Worcester, and then a third track between Framingham and a point to the east. <clears throat> They all have a combination of improving capacity as well as, in some cases, making further speed improvements. So the travel time has progressed to something that is becoming, I think, noticeably more competitive compared to some of the earlier alternatives when, when we look at it that way. Um, we also have assumed and tested a 90 mile an hour maximum speed, uh, which is probably the practical limit in terms of a shared track, shared corridor environment. Um, and it has to do with the geometry of the track itself, but also the policies, in this case CSX, and I'll, I'll note virtually every other class one railroad in the nation says 90 miles an hour is all they're willing to consider in a shared track environment. And so NERI recognized that and reflected it in its analysis and we've carried it forward in, in this respect as well. And in this case, we also carried the direct rail service uh, up the rail line um, through Chester right to Pittsfield to test this component to understand the benefits of the rail line versus a bus connection in that respect, um, to understand the, the travel time conditions that could be achieved um, and be able to contrast that um, to operating it within the bus service or the existing service that's out there. Um, this is also something that is self-evident. The topography, again, is such. The uh, Westfield River is climbing up through some very narrow valleys. Um, it is very difficult terrain, um, and there is not a lot that can be done, frankly, to improve the travel times on the rail corridor through this area because of the mountainous conditions, and that simply isn't something that we have to acknowledge. Uh, we did our best to look at it. The team went back several times, but that's just the reality of, of what we have here in, in that respect. And you can see now that the speed range graphic uh, carries those speed ranges all the way through. If I went back to the alternative zero, the existing, um, you would still find a lot of green and the, uh, that shade of blue in there because of those conditions. Alternative four, um, this is a little different. Um, and, and because of the challenges, frankly, in having a shared corridor and a shared track corridor, um, we looked at an alternative that said, instead of building more double track next to the existing CSX track, this essentially calls for a new mainline passenger line parallel to the existing CSX alignment. Um, so it goes from, from Worcester, you know, all the way out to, to Springfield in that respect. Um, th there are some obvious costs to that, but there are also some benefits to that. And, and one is 
Um, this would be a new rail line that would be approximately 25 feet from the existing tracks. That conforms with CSX policy on new investments. It also means from a constructability standpoint, you can largely construct something of that nature without interference to the existing freight train movements that are out there, or potentially passenger train movements in, in a phase and then switching over to something like this. The other major benefit um, in thinking of it this way is, is it liberates, in some respect, the engineering constraints of building and designing a track that is capable of handling a 10,000 foot long freight train um, and, and allows it really to be designed around passenger service. Um, and so it allows higher speeds through curves. It allows potentially some higher speeds on, on the, the, the straightaways. Um, it allowed us to optimize it in such a way that again, you'll see quite a big jump or, or decrement in this case in the travel time uh, because of those changes. Um, it also very likely establishes something that is critically important in any passenger service, whether it's commuter or inner city or anything else, and that's reliability. And having an asset, an infrastructure asset that is dedicated to a passenger service as opposed to a shared asset makes a big difference in terms of the reliability operation and also the flexibility in when you can time trains to operate back and forth. So there are clear trade-offs, um, and it's not trivial to think about adding a whole new track next to an existing railroad, but at the same time, there are other attributes that, from our perspective, said it's worthy to study this more and bring it forward, and, and that's how Alternative 4 was included in, the, in this range of alternatives. And now, so you see here in the graphic is the, the sort of magenta line that is next to the existing corridor. It actually would cross from one side of the rail line to the other, um, west of Worcester, somewhere in the area around Charlton, um, if, if I'm saying that correctly. And that's, there's enough work that has been done that we are comfortable that there is real estate available to undertake this um, and that there, the, the feasible, physical feasibility of it is possible. Um, there's liable to be a lot of impacts both from an environmental perspective, um, Act 97, I can go off with a lot of ranges. We haven't done any of that. That's really one of our next steps to go through. But nonetheless, looking at this, there are clear benefits in terms of travel time and services that make it worthwhile. And you can see in the, in the speed range, um, the colors have started to change. They started to move up into a set of ranges that really talk about higher speeds. Maximum speed in this alternative is 110. And there was enough parts of this alignment from a geometric perspective to support substantial operation at that rate, and we wanted to put it forward and test it. Alternative five builds on alternative four um, and basically takes that same concept of putting a new rail alignment next to the freight corridor, but then also addresses some of the significant curvature that is in place today. And it is populated in various different areas between Springfield and, and Worcester. Um, and so this would introduce some alignment changes um, to get rid of what are some restrictive curves in the three to four to five degree range. Railroads use degree of curvature to describe the sharpness of the curves. Highways use radius, um, if you can think of that, a three degree curve, which is a 60 mile an hour curve in the railroad is probably about a 6,000 foot radius on a highway. So you can think of it in that way, respect a, a half a degree curve, which allows 150 miles an hour, is a 25,000 foot radius. Um, and so you can think, geometrically, it really starts to grow in a very large way. Um, but the physical capability of this area allows us to think about what are shown in the light blue as curved modifications to sustain higher speeds along the entire segment. Um, and, and so this was, a, this was an alternative um, that was able to achieve the first uh, goal we set early on in the study to think about an hour and a half trip between Boston and Springfield. And, and introducing this type of investment with the services seems to bring you to the point um, that we can, we can talk about that. This also continued uh, with the bus shuttle this alignment did. Um, 
Um, but that's not the only, as I said before, this is intended to be somewhat of a matrix that we can mix and match in this. Nonetheless, the bus shuttle with a with coordinated transfer takes advantage of those increased travel times between Springfield and Boston. And so there are benefits that accrue across the entire corridor and, and the region. Okay, got one left uh, of our six so far. Um, and that was, we were, we, we frankly think alternative five is, is uh, there's reasons to look at it carefully. We're looking, waiting to hear from everybody else on, on that. Um, but we didn't want to stop there, and, and we wanted to investigate what could be an even higher speed corridor, um, and, and so chose to look at an alignment along the Mass Pike, along I-90, um, to take advantage of an alignment that was constructed roughly a century after the rail line was built. So it was built to different designs. Um, the bridge builders there had access to equipment that the early rail builders didn't have. So they could put in bigger and longer bridges and really start to address the alignment in a way that, that made a big difference. You ride that enough to know that, that what the alignment looks like. Um, and it's really also a completely separate corridor um, for many aspects. So uh, it gets you away from that original historic corridor. It goes all the way back to the 1840s out of Boston. So it's been around for a while. Um, and we tested this going from Boston right through Springfield, um, right up to Lee, and then up the rail corridor into Pittsfield. So it would be a direct ride right from Pittsfield into Boston along a highway corridor uh, that doesn't exist today. Maximum speed in this case was 150 miles an hour we looked at to try and get an alignment in that respect. I'll note that once you get above really about 115, maybe 120 miles an hour, uh, effective rail service requires electrification. We haven't costed any of this yet, but I'm just bringing this would be an alignment and an alternative that would likely require electrification to allow that to happen. Um, and this is, you know, there's a rail corridor and there's a highway corridor, and you can see the differences at a high level in terms of what the alignments look like and how they fit and travel between the same points. Um, the I-90 alignment has much steeper grades than the rail corridor. Um, that shouldn't surprise anybody. Um, passenger trains have a, it's called a horsepower to weight ratio that is capable of accommodating much deeper grades than freight trains can. So we don't believe that in of itself is, is a fatal flaw in, in terms of thinking about this. And this is what the graphic looks like with that type of concept in place. Um, what it shows also is we kept some common elements. We wanted, regardless of which alignment, which alternative it was, um, that they would serve Springfield Union Station, they would serve Worcester Union Station, they would serve South Station. And so there are some line deviations on this off of the highway alignment at those locations to bring them back to these hubs that are important within the region and, and important in, 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 from many, many transportation perspectives. And so that's what you see at, at, when you get to those areas. What's also very interesting to me is when you look at the speed range, although there are sections capable of accepting 150 miles an hour operation, there are a number of sections that are not. And that's even though the highway was built to modern design standards at the time, it still has a fairly high number of curves in it that are restrictive. And, and sticking to the highway alignment means you have to conform to that and the geometry that brings it out. So the speed range table here reflects those changes in what you see. Nonetheless, and no surprise, this is the shortest travel time of all, and, and as one would expect. And it gets us down to a, a point that I think is competitive under all these different circumstances. And so you didn't have to write down each one of those individually. We have a summary in here that gives you all the attributes and, and for each of the different alternatives I described and then the major changes that take place. Um, Ethan, you want to come back or? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, that was great. Uh, so 
this is just our, to highlight our next steps are really to, to after feedback to dig more deeply into these six alternatives. Uh, <clears throat> obviously looking at what kind of benefits there will be, impacts, whether that's right of way, uh, environmental, cultural resources, things like that. And uh, obviously we're going to dig a lot deeper into cost, both capital and operating. And then sort of there's where the trade-offs are, there are some pieces of it that obviously we have to talk about here today. And then uh, we have our next. So here's the uh, inverted triangle again. This is just to orient us where we are. So, uh, so here's uh, roughly what we're going to be doing. Uh, this, I think this is a new slide. So uh, ridership, uh, there is a, a computer model that we're going to be using. And <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, key characteristics along the corridor that are going to be incorporated into the analysis. And physical impacts, property, right of way, uh, wetlands, and I already mentioned some of these, but just uh, they're up here on the bulleted slide now. And uh, right, bridges, roads, utilities, because there's uh, obviously, especially on uh, alternative six, along the turnpike corridor, you're going to have, there's going to be a lot of bridging of both the interchanges and um, whether it be natural uh, bodies of water or uh, hilly terrain. And then uh, environmental, there's, we're going to have to take a sort of a high level look at what the permitting aspect would be because ultimately, and if anything were to move forward, uh, the environmental perm permitting process is a regulatory process. It's not something that uh, one, we control, and two, uh, there is a, a, a feasibility aspect, meaning sometimes if the impacts are too high, something is unpermittable from a, um, an environmental standpoint. And it's going to look at noise, air quality, uh, and any addi additional impacts. And then I mentioned cost. So uh, here's our study schedule. Um, we're on that big red line. So from a timeline standpoint, we're halfway through. But uh, from, uh, you know, we, we still have a lot of analysis work to do. There was a lot of, the meat of it was obviously existing conditions and development, but uh, analysis is just as much work as the first steps as we just completed. And uh, again, these, this is uh, Michaela and I as project managers, and really uh, it's to open it up now to advisory committee, uh, feedback, comments, questions. Uh, we have two microphones uh, to be passed around. We can just suppose, split it on either side. I'll, I'll walk one over here. So, Rick. I, is the turnpike um, all within existing right away? Um, <clears throat> short answer is no. Uh, again, as Drew noted, uh, connecting over to, let's say, Worcester uh, had to bring us outside the right of way. Um, but generally, there is a pretty wide right of way for the turnpike. Um, but next step is when we look at more, in more detail at the right of way lines, setbacks, and curvatures. So at this point, uh, it's at we'll a front. Please feel free to. Yeah. Also, it's, it, it's extremely challenging at the eastern end as you approach Boston. Um, and there's physically not enough room on the turnpike itself. Uh, when you were talking about the off-peak period, I go by that last time uh, last week at 11 a.m. and it was stopped dead. So I'm not sure what the, the off-peak is. But physically, there's probably not enough room to accommodate a rail line of any nature. So we have to look at then accommodating it in parallel to the existing Worcester line. Two to three a.m. Yeah. is off yeah. peak. <laughs> We've dug into the numbers. On alternatives one, two, and five with the bus transfers, are you considering high-speed bus lanes or designated bus lanes, considering the fact that it's only two lanes from Pittsfield to Springfield? So at this point, we hadn't necessarily thought that far into the bus service itself, but because of how competitive uh, the travel time is between Pittsfield and Springfield, that's why we have that bus connectivity as well as the constraints along the, cord the existing rail corridor. Um, but that's certainly something we can uh, at least look into at a, at a cursory level. I think that's something we can look at. Thank you very much. Um, to pick up on that, on the bus situation, uh, anything that does not include rail to the Berkshires, I would eliminate. 
I, <laughs> I, I do like three, four, and six. And I would just make a slight proviso in six if for consideration that we would swap Blanford for Chester. And I say that from the standpoint that you and I have been working very closely on the turnpike interchange between three and two. And in my opinion, I think we're zeroing in kind of closer to Blanford than anything else. So I think the, the turnpike exit in that Blanford area, if that was to proceed, would free up a great opportunity for Chester and those hill towns. Thank you. Um, alternatives five and six both note a Palmer station to be an additional three to five minutes. Um, I'm curious why it wasn't just included um, in these alternatives and particularly with the one, the alternative alignment on the Mass Pike, we do have an exit eight. Understood. Um, yeah, the, for alternative six, uh, the thought was uh, it, the, the station stop would be so far away from the CBD uh, and, and trying to bring the, 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 re the line uh, into the CBD uh, would be challenging, so we didn't include it in this alternative, um, but open for discussion. Uh, I, obviously, we know your thoughts, but yeah, open. I think, should, I think it should be included in both, both alternatives. Um, two thoughts on five. Um, Six, I understand. Yeah, uh, and, and once again, I'm not going to belabor it, um, but we consciously chose to try and not include stops, Palmer being one or Chester, um, in some of the alternatives, but not all the alternatives, so that we could get a better sense of the demand and the benefits that accrue from those stops. And, 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 and again, the alternatives that were selected were to view a range of different services and not necessarily precisely aligned in, in what we talked about today. So they, they are intended to be flexible, to take feedback, to get an understanding of it, and then move forward in, into the more detailed analysis. Ethan, where are you, Representative Petrolati, right here? Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> where are you in the discussions with CSX relative to the sharing of the lines? Um, we haven't had those discussions yet. Um, we, uh, they, they, we have a policy uh, as far as sharing the corridor uh, with separation. So at this point, we're, uh, we're just abiding by their policy in terms of separation. Um, for the shared trackage, um, similar to NERI, um, you know, CSX is the, the host railroad, so any, any kind of alternatives uh, that, would, that move forward, any recommendations, there obviously would have to be um, a lot of coordination and communication with CSX. Um, but as always, it is their corridor and, it, and it's their choice whether or not they, choose, they, they participate. Uh, Representative Tom Small, thank you very much for the, for the work you've done. Um, I would just echo what Representative Petrolati had said. Obviously, I think that issue in and of itself, and I know that there's challenges involved with that, but it, that's really at the crux, I Understood. think, of, of all the work that we're doing here. Everybody and all the stakeholders that are here in this room and all the conversations that we're having relative to various alternatives here, th this is all good work and it's all very, very helpful. But getting to the very core of, of that issue, I think, is, is something that is of great concern to everybody that's on this committee and certainly to, to all the people in the communities. I, I do want to reiterate what, what Linda ha had said from Palmer as well. And, and I understand the, the desire to exclude a stop like Palmer in some of these places, and, and I get the rationale and the reasoning. Having said that, I think one of the primary issues that many of the stakeholders here are trying to call attention to is the fact that the reason we're pushing so aggressively for stops in places like Palmer is because it's basically a feeder for the region. So as we talk about issues of economic development, uh, the desire for people to move from east, uh, Eastern Mass to Western Massachusetts to utilize this as a primary transportation hub, that um, we have to be able to give them the alternatives to be able to come into the particular regions. I don't want these communities to get lost in the shuffle with that as we focus on these alternatives. So um, I, I do appreciate the work that has been done here. I know that there's been a lot of time spent on it, but I, I'd like um, there to be a real focus, at least from this committee, on the importance of having some of those feeder stops there along the way in whatever alternatives we move forward. So, Understood. Thank yeah, you. As far as... Uh, uh, yeah, so we have not 
baked the alternatives enough yet that we can't add those kinds of things. And obviously it was more like, for example, alternative six, with a high speed service or higher speed service, any stops you introduce start to add to the travel time. So we were just initially trying to sort of limit the number of stops on a higher speed and, and so that the travel could be to a, a bigger hub. But we hear you and so we'll, thank you. Thank you, I just, I just want to add one more thing, sure. in ter uh, question. In terms of the maximum allowable speed that is in these alternatives, can somebody explain to me how that is factored in via these routes? So if you got 150 miles per hour as a maximum speed, yeah. obviously the, the way this track is, the snake track, so to speak, is, is lined out. Right. T tell me how that factors in in terms of the time bracket that you have in there, be it one tw uh, an hour and 25 minutes to two hours or whatever. How does that work utilizing the, this max speed formula? Is it, it, is it factoring in basically the long stretches at full capacity than the slowing? That, how does that formula work, just so that I can understand it? Yeah, that one I'm going to turn over to Drew. Um, but as far, I, I do want to double back on your CSX uh, uh, questions. You, ultimately, we are in a very early stage um, to sort of bring six high-level conceptual alternatives to the host railroad at this point. Well, it would be great to have them participating in the advisory committee. Um, they have a lot of other commitments and a lot of other, you know, they're dealing with their freight service. But uh, the just being at some point, um, you know, if anything move forward, we would engage them when, uh, later in the process. It's still very early in terms of a conceptual uh, stage. So for each of the alternatives, including alternative six, um, um, we went through a two-stage process. Um, and, and there was an engineering analysis of the alignment that went curve by curve uh, understanding whether it was a left-hand curve or a right-hand curve, and then the straight stretches or tangent track in between those um, in terms of what the allowable maximum speed would be on the curves, and then applied it uh, through whatever associated curves are there to, and the tangent track, and, and did that for the entire alternative, uh, the corridor length of it. Um, even at a high level, we got pretty detailed and getting down to as little as 50 feet between curves, because we wanted to try and get as accurate an assessment as possible, knowing that this was a critical aspect of our work and, our, and this study, to be able to say with some level of confidence what the travel times would look like. The next step was to take and build a, a, a sort of a simulated schedule uh, of travel time uh, that a train would be without t undertaking a third step, and I'll get to that, um, so this was an interim process to understand um, how a train might travel through a section of rail alignment with the series of curves that are involved, taking advantage of the maximum speeds that are out there, but also respecting the physical limitations of, of the curve sections of the, of the geometry. And then we built in some station stops that were represented in each of the alternatives, and, and also something that's in every schedule in the world called recovery time to try and have a relatively accurate uh, assessment of what the travel time likely would be. The third step, which we'll get to in, as our work advances, is to take the, the body of information from the first two phases and then undertake a much more rigorous simulation, a computer simulation of the geometry and the performance of the equipment um, and the schedule patterns to, to really come to the next level of confidence in what the travel times would look like. So that's a piece of work that's ahead of us yet. When we get down to those third alternatives, we'll have that, that, that fully completed. But at this point, we feel we have a reasonably accurate assessment of what the travel time capabilities of each of the alternatives are. Hmm? Thanks, Drew. Thank you. Uh, I had a question and a, a larger point to make. So the question is, a few of these alternatives show some improvements along the worcester Framingham line centered around Westboro. I'm not sure what those are. I'm, I work on that line pretty regularly. Could you amplify? And again, they're not significant, um, but they would be optimizing the curve alignment where possible. Um, and, and I could spend a lot of time on what that means, but yeah. tr trust me, it, it means if you can get another five or 10 miles an hour yeah. of a stretch, we would build that into the optimization. 
um, and look at whether or not the maximum speed, there are one or two areas of straight track in that area that mm. are long enough that a train could take advantage of it um, to push it up from 80 to 90 miles an hour. We were seeking in, in realistic fashion every opportunity to reduce travel time where we could. And those are some of the areas that, that struck us as, as feasible. And I absolutely applaud that sentiment, as I'm sure everyone here does, uh, particularly as someone who takes the Worcester Framingham line. So it, the larger point is, myself and a few other members of this group are on the state's Rail Visions Advisory Committee, looking at the future of the commuter rail system. And this is a question more from MassDOT, but the sixth alternative with the I-90 corridor is an intriguing concept and one that thus far is not part of that conversation. I would hope that this could be brought up in that forum as well, vis-a-vis -vis the, the larger scale revisiting of the state's commuter rail system. I, I'd like to know more about that model. Um, <clears throat> as far as rail vision, uh, we'll, most, we'll most certainly, we have, uh, the people in our office are working on Rail Vision as well, and we're, we're coordinating. So uh, we'll double back and, and have the conversation about sort of the concept and where it fits into their vision of, of Rail Vision. I don't know, Astrid, is there anything you wanted to add? The two studies are plainly very important and can connect at some point but they're in slightly different timing. So this is one of the virtues of having the people who are doing the work have desks about 25 feet apart. So they will talk, but I, you won't necessarily see the same thing at the same time in both studies. Ethan, can you talk more about how you'll go from six to three, including whether any of the four evaluation criteria has more weight than another? Uh, so uh, six to three is really going to be uh, teased out when we do more alternatives analysis. I think uh, my sense, but it's hard to predict the future, um, is that there'll be some things that stand out um, on some alternatives and maybe some impacts on, on other alternatives. So ultimately, it's, it's the, the alternatives analysis, I feel, will drive a lot of some of the, some of these may go to the wayside. These maybe seem unpermittable. Uh, or maybe this is uh, a sufficient service. This next step is maybe a, a lot more capital cost for minimal benefit. So I think it is a comparison of the alternatives, so it's hard to say exactly how it's going to happen, but that's the gist of how it would go. And as far as waiting, uh, we have not yet uh, really dug into our alternate uh, evaluation criteria yet. Generally, we don't weight them. Uh, they are sort of because certain criteria mean more to um, certain advisory committee members than other ones, so it is more about how you take them as a whole. You look at them across the board and uh, you know, the benefits and, or really trade-offs of, of the various evaluation criteria. Oh, yes. So Ethan, just uh, Senator, <coughs> sir. want to just say thank you very much, and um, we, we really, it, it was obviously an immense undertaking, so we appreciate the work so far and, um, and uh, that you and your whole team have done. So uh, just a, a couple uh, points. Uh, one is I just want to reiterate what uh, Rep. Smala brought up and, and Linda brought up uh, about a Palmer stop. Um, ideally, just seeing a Palmer integrated into more of the options when you kind of work towards uh, mm -hmm. options and certainly uh, having Palmer included in the final uh, and at least one, hopefully more than one, of the final three uh, recommendations is, is very important. And I know um, there's other legislators that have indicated that to me as well. Um, so including Palmer is essential. Uh, the other thing is, is if at all possible, and I know there's a lot of elements to it, but going back and providing potentially, you know, even if it's a pie in the sky or very high level, what a one hour trip between Springfield and Boston would look like. Uh, if it's completely unrealistic, frankly, that's helpful to know also. Uh, but I think uh, psychologically, the, and the mayor and I were talking about this, an hour trip uh, between Springfield and Boston uh, would, would do a lot. Certainly 80 minutes is very, very good, but yeah. um, just having the team kind of present that Okay. in some respects. And then the final uh, piece, and it's related to the Palmer stop, you mentioned at the end the analysis that's going to be done about uh, the ridership estimates. Mm -hmm. um, if at all possible, if that could really be a dynamic analysis that also shows how the economy will change statewide 
with this investment. Part of the point of this is not just to reinforce existing commuter and economic patterns, but to change them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, for example, including a stop in Palmer, what that does for Palmer and for the entire region around Palmer. The same would go for Chester and certainly Springfield. And I also think an analysis of what it will do for Boston is very important because we're inundated with study after study of the traffic congestion, the housing price increases, and what this would do as an escape valve and as a way to, to, um, to address those issues in Boston, I think will, will, will be very important as well because as far as I see it, the point of a project like this is is not just to sort of nibble around the edges of um, of, uh, of patterns in the economy that are happening anyway, but to actually bend the curve and to change those patterns. And you saw this in Boston. I mean, nobody would have expected the seaport 20 years ago to be a biotechnology hub and an innovation hub. Mm -hmm. It was the big dig that made that happen. Similarly, the Green Line extension and what that's done for development in Somerville and in, uh, and in Medford and other places. So it'd be helpful to sort of paint a picture for people of what will be different and what can be different in the future with an investment like this. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, our intent, uh, we're, we're working through the, the, the economics of, of the analysis right now, just sort of how we're going to approach it. And obviously, indirect benefits are, are a big part of, uh, uh, we call them indirect benefits. But basically, it's just, yes, there are construction jobs for any kind of project. That's sort of a direct uh, benefit. Looking at what kind of transit-oriented development would happen, uh, what kind of travel patterns may, may or may not change. and so. Looking at it from an economics perspective is a big part of what we're going to be doing as well. So uh, thank you for the feedback, and this, this will be all part of our analysis. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you very much for everybody coming out to uh, uh, Springfield. And, I, and again, I want to uh, thank Senator Lesser, uh, Governor uh, Baker. Uh, I'd also like to thank Tim Brennan, who has been on the forefront of this for many, many years. Tim, and <laughs> bittersweet losing you, but congratulations on your retirement. But Tim and I did a road show out at 16 Acres Library, and we had the Palmer people that were there, and I think Palmer uh, probably plays a key role in anything going forward. Uh, but it's back to the future. Uh, when railroads were first built, boom times uh, occurred uh, where they were had the stops and uh, were built up at that point in time. But besides the transportation aspects, the economic development, the housing, the good four-letter word of, of jobs are key. And uh, if the federal government uh, can work in a bipartisan fashion, and uh, we go to our conduit with uh, uh, Congressman Neal, uh, Chairman Neal, the infrastructure project uh, program could be very beneficial to us, much like the stimulus program that occurred under the Obama administration. You had to be ready to go. And we were here in uh, Springfield. So the stars could be aligned. But uh, as Senator Lesser had uh, uh, indicated, uh, if we could look, and I know there's strategic points that have to be looked at. And my whole thing about uh, you know what is realistic, uh, what is uh, uh, financially feasible, uh, and what is sustainable, uh, because the stars are aligned. And if we could pick up that infrastructure uh, if it is passed on the federal level, uh, it could be very, very uh, beneficial uh, on it. The, the last thing uh, would be, as far as what Senator Lesser had indicated, uh, if you could, I'm being parochial now, as many of the others in the room here from Springfield, if there was a possible way that you could traverse from Springfield uh, to Boston, uh, you know, an hour, hour 10, boy, you open up huge uh, uh, pathways. That would really, uh, to the and to Springfield and Western Mass, western part of the state, I know there's more time frame uh, added going up to the Berkshire area, but, um, you know, we have a great divide. Uh, the, uh, the spoils of the east and we have the golden west here. That would really uh, close the great divide and, uh, uh, as Senator Lesser indicated, the escape valve of uh, going west. But I think having this all put across, we need to see some cost. Obviously, the state has the ante up, and we appreciate uh, Governor Baker. But with Chairman Neal, with Richie, that could be uh, key if bipartisan. If anybody can work bipartisan, it's, it's Richie. 
uh, in that infrastructure program. And I just liken it, I'm making an analogy, and I'll, I'll end here, uh, uh, the stimulus program. If you were ready to go, and we had the advocates on the state and federal level, uh, the money came, and a you know, prime example, you look at Union Station, some other things that were done um, here. But I really thank everybody taking the time to come to um, Springfield. Uh, Boston is, uh, you know, exploding in a good way. Springfield in our area has a lot of good things going on. But if we gave that option that uh, with the housing costs we have, uh, the quality of life that we have, uh, Berkshire areas, other areas, people will say, boy, if I can get back and forth from the eastern part of the state, hour, hour and 10 minutes, many companies now are allowing you to work from rail, I know you're looking at options of uh, bus uh, options or shuttles, but if we're going to do it, you know, let's let's do it right. Uh, sink in the money and uh, have that straight shoot. I mean, north south is going very very well. I noticed in some of the numbers here, you go as low as six trips to ten to the uh, epitome would be sixteen back and forth. So. Uh, I just appreciate everybody's uh, uh, being here and having a plan ready to go. And if they pass that infrastructure uh, program in a bipartisan fashion, boy, we'd be very well positioned uh, with the leadership we have here in the state and the leadership we have on the federal level. So thank you very much. And thank you for your detailed you. presentation. I know this is very helpful to me and the individuals here, whether elected or not, and to the media. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just ma make one more comment on, sure. on the benefit to the region. Um, yeah. The town of Palmer contracted with the Center of Economic Development at UMass, mm -hmm. and we submitted a report to you. Thank you so much for um, sharing it with your team. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and read it. what they looked at was the t um, 21 communities making up the lower Quabbin region, serving over um, 175,000 residents within that area. And that if a station in Palmer is included, that entire region would be um, would be served. So I thank you for that. There's also, as you know, um, sections re uh, related to housing and um, age riders. And so thank you for, for looking that over. Oh, th uh, thank you for taking the initiative. Appreciate it. We do have some information on one hour going. Um, well, it's, yeah, we can, next meeting. Um, if there's no other uh, advisory, yes, Paul. Just one other point. Uh, in December at the meeting, the, the value that one of the first slides talked about, economic development in Western Mass, yeah. a point I made and a lot of other people concurred with is this is not just an economic development scenario for Western Mass. It certainly is, but it, it's also a value to Central Mass mm -hmm. and Eastern Mass, and I think that's important to be noted, as has been noted by a lot of other people. The Worcester Framingham line, I would point out, from 2012 to 2018 had a 46% increase in ridership. So w when you start looking at those numbers to the east and couple it here, I think it's important to note it's not just an economic development value mm -hmm. to Springfield and Western Mass, but to the other communities along the corridor. Understood, definitely. Thank you so much. I just wanted to underscore when you were talking about capital improvements and things that will need to be studied as we move forward, parking. If people cannot park at train stations, they cannot get on the train. We see this all the time with the commuter yeah. rail. I myself have stopped at multiple stations and not found anywhere to park and have gotten closer and closer to the city. So I would hope that that would be included. I also just want to underscore the importance when we're looking at ridership numbers of really trying to understand how, if the train connected well to the knowledge corridor, how many more riders that would bring onto the train. And then the part that I think is harder for us to understand because we would need to collaborate with Connecticut this route would create a Boston New York corridor as well and we cannot underestimate the importance of the number of people in Connecticut who would get on that train and come through Springfield and go to Boston and that's really just going to be key in assessing the viability of the of the route so thank you for that understood thank you um, if there's no more uh, advisory committee uh, comments questions feedback we can open it up to the public <coughs> Thank you. That's a few. 
might as well take it down the line. Uh, raise your hand, please. Hi, Dave Pierce, Chester. Uh, in alternative four, you talked about uh, a third track. And I wasn't clear on if you knew that there had been a third track in the past, and that's already cleared. You, you mentioned 25 feet away. It's probably 25 feet track center to track center to where the old track was. So that's already available. It'd probably save you some money. And on the CSX question, uh, also, I wasn't, wasn't clear if you were aware that it had been on this on for sale list of CSX in 2018 on and off a couple of times. So they might be looking to unload it. And they just spent four months upgrading the whole line, all new ties, ballast, rail. So it's in probably the best shape it's ever been in right now. Thank you. I'm Richard Holzman, and I'm from Chester and Pioneer Valley. Uh, planning Commissioner for Chester uh, and an advocate for uh, the East-West Rail all the way. And that's frankly uh, without uh, a bus plan because I think that will be counterproductive. Uh, I'm, really <clears throat> I'm really impressed with the leadership around the table and the advisors with the people I know pretty well with Smitty and, and the mayor, Senator Lesser, Representative Smola. And you've done a great job. But frankly, uh, I would not support anything that has to do with buses, because I think in the end, you have to have feeder rail. And you, even if it meant that it wasn't quite as fast, where the speed, speed is one thing, but total travel time can be another thing. Because if it means that you get a railroad that goes to gridlock, because you have parking issues, connectivity issues and the like. I think that's just going to present a whole other set of problems. Um, so I'd encourage us to keep going and, and uh, know that Chester and Palmer are uh, united in this, that we have a similar feature in, uh, in the hill towns as they have uh, in more central mass. And I think it can all work together very well. But I think we have to be bold, we have to be imaginative, and we have to make sure it's all rail. Thank you. Ben Hood, uh, the chairman of the Palmer Rail Steering Committee of the town of Palmer, um, also a citizens for Palmer Rail Stop. And we've had very, very helpful representation at our table from Linda LaDuke. And Todd Smola and Eric Lesser, um, and we've had a great dialogue with Mayor Sarno, and we appreciate that continuing because we see ourselves as part of the Springfield metropolitan area. So, this is the kind of development that would, you know, bring our area into that connection to the eastern part of the state and benefit all of us. And we do actually work with the people from Chester because they are part of the state of Massachusetts on the other side of Springfield. In a sense, if we don't reach all the way to Pittsfield and probably beyond into New York State, we aren't really going to get the kind of kind of robust development and effect from this train service that we need, and it should be a train. Um, I want to make one small point, because everyone's made all the really big points about, about Palmer, which is that it's one mile from the CVS to the entrance to the Pike in Palmer. Um, it's a two-minute walk, and it's a good, healthy walk. So someone getting off the train there could go that way into the downtown um, if you okay. chose al alternative six. You could also walk the other direction to Thorndike, which is one of the vi four villages of Palmer. So in a sense, the Pike is centrally located in Palmer. The Palmer Town Hall isn't even there. It's at another four corners the other way. And so Palmer is a town with four villages surrounding the Pike. So just to point out that if you did alternative six, you might want to consider keeping a train stop in Palmer even under that scenario. Thank you. Understood. Uh, Karen Christensen, Berkshire Publishing Group and the Train Campaign. I want to speak for Pittsfield. Pittsfield is a connect, a, a hub, a potential hub to New York. Um, not only with the Berkshire flyer that Senator Adam Hines has been promoting, but the restored Berkshire Housatonic line, which will be a line that, uh, that traditionally brought people up through Western Connecticut. There's a lot of activity in Connecticut. We do want to connect to Connecticut. We want to connect to New York City, which is the other huge economic hub for this region of the world. And um, 
So this east-west line has at to, to Pittsfield, rail to Pittsfield, is absolutely crucial. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a consumer. I live in Pittsfield, and I use Metro North. I don't know whether you guys have done any comparisons on it, but um, we go down to New York City. I drive to Wasaic. It's an hour and a quarter down there. It's a two-hour train trip ride, and it's not particularly expensive. But when I go down to New York for the city, for the opera, or for the symphony, I can get home. MBTA trains stop running at 8 p.m. Next point, you talk about access on the CSX tracks. 60 years ago, in order to get your ICC operating certificate for interstate rail traffic, you had to offer passenger service, and the passenger service had to have the right of way over the freight, freight traffic. Now, this is an intrastate matter as opposed to an interstate one, but I think everybody could learn from that. Last, I come late to this party in terms of the previous studies, but as a former GE legal executive, I'm wondering if you guys have done any need assessments from your potential customers, because it doesn't seem to me like you've factored that in. I would not bother to ride a bus because I can put my butt in the car. I do it right now, and I certainly don't want to do it on a new multi-billion dollar thing. So please, consider our convenience as well. Thank you. I just follow up on this gentleman's uh, comments on Metro North. We, we have uh, the ability right here in Springfield, thanks in great part to the work the mayor's done, with uh, the old Westinghouse plant to build self-propelled cars. Envision, if you would, taking advantage of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that you have, which is supported by all of the advocates here. And thank you for all the work both of these committees are doing. You have the opportunity now, once in a lifetime, to invent the future our neighbors need now. The Metro North analogy is important because you could conceivably have that type of car built right here in Springfield that could go back and forth between stops like Palmer and Chester. Why are Palmer and Chester important, you might ask? You've heard some of the answers. I'd paint a picture this way. Look at Palmer and Chester and others as a reservoir, a reservoir for the surrounding watershed of populace. If you build it, we, they will come. The last thing I would say to you is a word of encouragement. Thank you, keep up the great work. And I'd leave you with this thought. We are Massachusetts. We can do this. I'm Emmy Shepard. I'm with the Citizens for Palmer Rail Stop, and I'm not going to repeat all of all of the things that have been said here. I just want this morning. I happened to be watching NECN really early in the morning, and saw a traffic report. It's important that we get cars off the road. It was an hour and a half from 495 to the Pru. Hi everybody, my name is Jessica Sizer. I'm a member of the Palmer Town Council and I'm also a student at UMass Amherst. I'm probably one of the youngest ones in the room, so <laughs> um, I would just like to say that I'm speaking from the future. Um, I'm a part of the future workforce. I'll get my master's degree next year. And when I think about, um, as you know, a public policy person, when I think about where I wanna be in my career, but where I wanna live, um, I'm in two different places. And I really don't want to move out of Western Mass because I, I love this community. I love my hometown. And speaking from a student perspective as well, um, it's a lot easier to get from, and I'm also a commuter from Palmer to UMass. It's a lot easier for me to get from UMass to Palmer to get on a train than it would be for me to get from UMass to Springfield to get on a train because I've made the commutes for internships and in, in otherwise to both Springfield and Palmer. And I know from a student's perspective, it'd be a lot easier for us to get from all five colleges for us to get on 
in Palmer and then get to Boston where we have Mount Ida College as well, or the Mount Ida campus for UMass and other internship opportunities. So I just hope that you guys take that perspective moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Garrett. I live up in Greenfield. And so I'm coming from this from a very much an outsider's perspective. But I saw there was an article in, I think it was the Globe, saying that T had an extra billion dollars it didn't know how to spend. And I'm looking at this process and hearing about, you know, we have to look at these studies, we haven't cost out how much this costs. And it just strikes me that it's really kind of amazing considering this is something, you, know, you mentioned the rail corridor is a couple hundred years old or 150 years old. You know, so we know this stuff has existed, we know it's worked. And it's just it's very odd to me, considering there's been other studies, that this process is so without an apparent timetable. And so, you know, as far as that money goes, I don't know who's supposed to be spending it. I'm sure you could find plenty of people in Western Mass that would say, try, try these things first. And so that's really the only extent of my comment. If there's money sloshing around, and there certainly is in Boston, I was there for a Red Sox game not that long ago, and it's amazing the difference between, you know, you go out of the city center, Where's that money going? It's not going here. So that's that's it. Thank you. Uh, Mark Schaap, Lennox. Uh, one thing you haven't mentioned is terminal capacity at both ends of this. If we're going to run passenger trains, originate and terminate passenger trains in Pittsfield, and I'm all for that, and, and, and you're going to originate and terminate more passenger trains than you run now between Boston and Worcester at Boston South Station, I, it seems to me, unless something is done with terminal capacity at Boston, let's say, uh, you're building a house with no foundation. The cost of expanding South Station or doing the uh, North-South rail link are going to be very expensive, as you, I'm sure you know. And it seems to me that needs to get done first before we talk about adding trains to and from any place else. And it's the same thing with Pittsfield. Pittsfield, isn't, there's one place I could think of uh, where well you could build a, a layover facility, because if we're going to originate trains in Pittsfield that want to get to Boston during the peak commuting hours, uh, you're going to have to have trains lay overnight, three or four train sets, to originate service in the morning. And we're not even talking about that. Also, I think that the, 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 there's no way you're going to have the money to do any of this, and at the same time build the smitty Pignatelli interchange on I-90. It's going to be one or the other. And we don't, need, we don't need to induce more driving than we already have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, Reagan, that, that is he, uh, one thing I guess that brings up that I, we, as far as uh, that's a very specific s sort of study related question, uh, looking at terminal ends of the corridor is something that we're going to be looking at as part of the next step of analysis. Uh, we understand South Station and South Station expansion project going on. So as far as our, when we come back to the, uh, the advisory committee next time, we will have um, a part of our presentation will be what our future no build projects are. So essentially projects that uh, we are assuming either would be in place or would need to be in place in order for any kind of east-west rail service uh, on, on our alternative. So that is something we are going to come back on, uh, come back to, uh, come back to the committee with. It's just at an early stage at this point where we're not that far, so. Uh, I'm in Keith and I'm at UMass as well. Um, I'm interested in this, uh, in my own studies economically, but as a user and as someone who thinks about equity, uh, for the buses, I would say do not think about um, people who are transit dependent, people who cannot afford uh, uh, using their own car. So uh, low income people, people elderly, people with disabilities, any type you have a transfer from a bus to a train, it adds the complexity that these people have to navigate. And as a study, I mean, take a, the, the train or the bus from like Springfield up to Amherst and do all these transfers yourself, and you'll see how difficult it is to rely on tr public transportation and having to get somewhere like a job or an appointment in a timely manner. So just 
think about that in your analysis when you put in a bus, it just adds complexity to people who are dependent on these things. And as a user myself, I'm very, uh, I don't have any other patience. So if I see a couple transfers, I'm gonna drive. So. Understood, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Good afternoon. My name is Donald Blaze, former Palmer Town Councilor. I'm glad to see that our community is very well represented here and at the table. Uh, I just want to say, as an advocate for this project for some time, uh, any of these alternatives that does not include Palmer, I will not support and I will oppose. Uh, as it's already been said, I know Linda spoke about it uh, a bit, but we are a region that has been lagging behind economically for some time now. That can't continue. Uh, I believe this, this project, if we do get a rail stop in Palmer, would turn it around. Uh, it might not be right away, but it will turn things around. So, uh, and again, you know, UMass just did a great uh, study, uh, a report. Uh, I just read it yesterday. Uh, if you haven't read it, please read it. I think it, it really tells you about our community and why uh, a rail stop uh, in Palmer would be beneficial, not just for us, but the region as a whole. We can't continue to like behind like this. So, and Chester, we can't forget them out there as well. Okay, um, I just, uh, one thing I should have mentioned uh, when I concluded the presentation, um, all of our presentation and the handouts uh, will be uh, posted online to our website and we will send out an email to the advisory committee letting them know it's been posted, and um, I believe that's it. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your feedback, both advisory committee and in public. Um, we appreciate it, and we will definitely take all this, go back, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be back out soon enough. Thank you.